So let's start with some introductions. My name's Kevin Sherwood. I work for Treyarch Audio, and I primarily work on Call of Duty. And I'm, I guess I'm known for uh, Black Ops Zombies music and feedback, apparently. <laughs> uh, and this is my buddy Corey Redgrift, who I've, how long have you known? What did we figure out? 15 or 16 years. 15 years? It's been a long time. All right, yeah, 15 years, apparently. <laughs> Uh, we met in college, and uh, he's been my piano player. Anytime I can't sequence something, I bring him in, and, and he plays for me. Um, let's see if this will work. I just got it to animate the other day. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start with some backstory. Oh, actually, no. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is essentially the zombie apocalypse, and. It's really weird to hear myself say that, but uh, <laughs> I'm at a Lutheran school talking about zombies and heavy metal, but hey. Uh, and what the zombie apocalypse is, it's a really a model about ethics versus survival. You know, what are you willing to do to survive? Uh, and I'm going to use this to explain how I write music for it, and I'm going to go a little bit into the theory of how I use modes to convey the, the feelings of the characters in our mode. And I'm going to use pulp co uh, po uh, pop culture references, and I'm primarily uh, going to use stuff that I found on the internet. <laughs> this is one of my favorite pictures from the internet. <laughs> I don't actually know who that is. Uh, I'm probably going to get sued after this. All right. So let's start with a little backstory. Uh, maybe you guys are interested in how I got here. Um, as long as I can remember, I wanted to play guitar from a very young age. You know, I had to beg my parents to get me one, and I was terrible when I first got it. Um, but here's, I got a picture for you that shows even at a young age, I had heavy metal flowing through my veins. <laughs> well, I mean, I had iron in my blood, so technically there's metal in my veins, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so. I ended up taking some lessons, getting a little better, playing some of my favorite songs. But uh, when I got to high school, I, I found out that I enjoyed beer a lot more than I liked practicing. So my studies kind of took a turn downhill until a significant event changed that. And that was that I caught mono. I don't know if any of you ever had mono before. But <laughs> what it essentially does is make you really tired. <laughs> so I think my mom took this picture of me, I'd fallen asleep practicing. But, so I couldn't leave the house anymore. I couldn't party with my friends, so it kind of forced me into a place where I had to practice. And that's all I did, and eventually it got to be about 10 hours a day, strict metronome practicing. And I learned about a school called the, the Berklee College of Music in Boston. And my parents, oh, we're having some tech issues, ah, thank you. Uh, my parents were just happy that I was interested in college because all I wanted to do was play video games and guitar. And honestly, those aren't good career choices. <laughs> but off to Berkeley I went. And while I was there, I met a couple of important people. Um, a guy named Ricardo Hernandez, who would become my drummer, and uh, this guy right here, Corey Redgrift, who was a singer and piano player, and we shared similar musical interest. And <laughs> Of course, you don't like this, but we, we rented an apartment together. There's the three of us. Uh, this poster was up on our wall. I don't, I, don't, I don't know why we did that, but <laughs> we did that. Uh, Ricky's the one with a football on his head in the left, and yeah. But it was the crappiest apartment in Boston. Um, it was in a basement. It, it was never meant to be an apartment. There was walls up in a space. Uh, Corey's room, the wall didn't touch the floor in many places. Uh, there were, I mean, there were mice, roaches. Uh, it was $2,400 a month, too. So and it was downtown Boston, and this was 2000, right? Yeah, it was yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, around 2000. It was terrible. Um, and none of us were fans of studying, really, either. Um, every, every midterm and final, we would get together in order to, you know, we, we would convince ourselves that we we're going to study this time. You know, we, we got to do this. But We'd end up playing video games and just, you know, studying songs that we got on Napster. Uh, you know, it might date me a little bit, but... Um, one of those nights, uh, Corey and I were looking at... I don't even know what we were studying. 
but we were looking at the music theory of a particular pop song. Um, right, yeah. yeah, and something just clicked, and we call it the secret of music conversation. And I know it sounds goofy, but in that moment, we actually figured out how to complete songs. Like, uh, there's something that we learned about harmony and melody that just fit together. And from then on, I was able to write songs, because up to that point, I'd have riffs and pieces, but I could never develop them or turn them into something. And this is the actual piece that we figured out, I guess. But uh, Corey wrote the A part, I wrote the B part. It was like 6 a.m. after being up all night playing Soul Calibur 1, I think, in the Dreamcast. But from then on, we were able to write. And without that moment, without meeting Corey and studying this particular song, I would not be able to do anything that I'm able to do today. And after that... <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> After that, Corey, Ricky, and I formed a band called Cube and we just wrote songs. That's all we did. I think we had 15 or 16 yeah. students recorded them. It turned out pretty well. Those are all on my YouTube channel, by the way, K Sherwood Ops, if you ever want to go and subscribe. Um, but Berkeley ended and it was time to go out into that career, you know, and, and fulfill your dream. And what I ended up doing was moving back home and playing World of Warcraft in my mom's basement <laughs> instead. Uh, right, so the parents were worried again. <laughs> and I, uh, I moved in with a girlfriend at the time and got a job selling furniture retail. So that was the music dream. Uh, you know, back in Michigan, selling furniture, people, uh, the customers. Oh my God, it was a terrible job. I mean, I was thankful for it, but uh, yeah. And then one day, Ricky called me, the drummer, from L.A. and said there were openings for game testers at Activision. And this blew my mind because I, I like, what do you mean game testing? And he's like, well, you play video games and they pay you for it. <laughs> I'm like, that, that can't be real. <laughs> so, and, he, and I looked it up and sure enough, you know, I'm from Michigan. You know, we work in factories. That's all we do. You know. uh, so that night, I broke up with my girlfriend. The next day, I left. That's how it was. It's a true story. I had a thousand bucks in my bank account. My mom gave me her uh, old Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme with 190,000 miles on it. I stuffed everything I had. It was up to the ceiling in the passenger seat. I got a couple books on tape from Cracker Barrel. And I think one of them was The Da Vinci Code. I listened to it like eight times. I hate that movie now. And I drove from Michigan to California in like three days, so it was like 16 hours of driving a day. It was pretty terrible. But I slept on Ricky's floor and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be a game tester. And I'm like, ah, I'm a shoe in no problem. <laughs> well, to get to be a game tester, you have to fill out a form online and they call you back. And it's a job that, you know, high school students could get in the summer. So no big deal, I put my name in, no call. Two weeks, no call. Ricky gets called, everyone else is getting called. I'm running out of money, I'm sleeping on his floor, his wife's not really digging that. So I, uh, I, call, I find out the recruiter's name and I call and I go through voicemails until I finally find her name and I say, hey, uh, I got a voicemail saying you wanted me to come in for an interview but it cut off before he gave me the address and the day. And uh, I, I waited and she called me back and said, oh, I'm really sorry, come in tomorrow at this time. So <laughs> now... <laughs> I understand there's a gray area in the ethics there, <laughs> but again, this is ethics versus survival, and I needed to survive, so that's what I did. So first day, interview, I'm on the 405. Has anyone ever been to LA or driven in LA? I'm really sorry. It is the worst thing that you can do. The 405 is horrible. I drive it every single day. Uh, I missed my exit and got lost in LA, and I was late. So. I ended up there, and, but they, you know, they took pity on me, I guess, after you know, scolding me about it. And I got hired. So, all right, $9 an hour, that's a start. And I'm playing video games, so fantastic. My commute was two hours each way, every single day. And it was about you know, second year in my car along the 405, so it was, it was a horrible commute. So next step, I need to get to a developer. You know, being a contract tester is one thing, but you need to get into the developer, because that's where the money is, and that's where you can do things. So we were testing Quake 4 for the PC, and 
the 360, the Xbox 360 was about to come out and no one had ever seen one before. So everyone wanted to play Quake 4 on the 360. But then there was another project, it was X-Men Legends 2 and the multiplayer was about to fail and they needed four people to test it and nobody wanted to do that. So you know, I said, I want to be on the 360. And I told one of my friends there to tell the guy when he came around looking for me that that's what I wanted to do. And I went outside, I, don't, I was on a break or something, and came back up and they're like, hi, you are on X-Men Legends 2. So I was like, okay, luck of the draw. Well, it turns out later he lied and got my slot for it, but uh, I don't know where he is now. So again, FX vs. Survival and he lost that one. So <laughs> I guess we're good. But. Uh, we were going to meet our lead that day, and a guy walked in. He said, my name's David Vonderhaar, and I'm the senior online manager of Central Tech. What do you want to do with your career? And right then I knew this is the guy I need to be with. So I said, I, I want to be in audio, and I will do as much overtime as you want. I don't care. And I spent the next year and a half learning. And he finally brought me over to Treyarch for COD Big Red One, and I met you know, a bunch of the, the leads and everything there and just worked as much as I possibly could. And then when I went to COD 3, um, all my timesheets said 100 to 115 hours a week, like easy. And, you know, I slept four hours a night, and this was months on end, you know, seven days a week. And at the end of it, you know, I talked to Mark Lamia, who's now the president of Treyarch, and he was the VP then. And I said, hey, man, you know, are you going to hire me? And at the end of it, I finally got hired. So student loans were able to be paid, finally. But uh, all those people took a chance on me, and I wanted to honor them, you know, in my little presentation here. So, with this humble face swap that I was able to put together, um, whether or not I still have a job when I go back, we'll, we'll have to see. But, uh, yeah. Oh, man, Mark's going to be mad about that one. Okay. So, the moral of my story, I guess, or the, the formula you can take away is that if you party in high school, you get mono, you practice guitar, you move to Boston, you meet two weirdos, you move back home, get a job selling furniture, move to California, game test, have someone try to screw you over, you'll end up in Edmonton in front of a Lutheran school talking about heavy metal and a game about Nazi zombies. <laughs> so it's that symbol. Uh, animation didn't work, but I guess we're good. So the original Zombies mode, just a little history on that, that started on a game called World at War when we were in crunch time. And the history is it was 2008, it was the ship year of World at War, and uh, Infinity War had just released Modern Warfare, and it was hugely successful, more than any other game that had ever been. And the world was sick of World War II, and we were making a World War II game. So we were labeled the B team, and no one wanted us to do it. So everyone was crunching, baseline of six days a week, 12 hours a day, but that honestly would have felt like a vacation. We were doing seven days a week, 14 to 16 hours a day. Uh, many 48, 24 hour shifts. Uh, my longest stint was 75 days in a row. Um, and we were obsessed, we were tired, you know, we were zombies. But that was studio survival, so it's what we had to do. And there were a couple guys, a couple programmers who were just in the back while we were making a game, making another game. It was this mode, it was no schedule for it, nobody had approved it, but all the departments were playing it. It, just, it was this organic thing that just grew from the ground up and we loved it. And we were, you know, we were there 16 hours a day and yet we were still playing this thing that was in our game that we always, you know, we saw every single day. So the president, you know, had to take a risk and approve it because Activision was looking at him like, you know, what are you doing? You know, we need to make sure this game sells. And that's how we knew. But what it did is really, it distilled the dark, twisted style that would be the Treyarch style into a game mode. And we finally had something that was uniquely ours, and it was bloody, brutal, dark, and beautiful. And the first map was called Nocturne Toten. And it was a simple map, you know, zombies defend. And when you would die, you would pan over the map and it would say game over and tell you your score. And when I saw it, I'm like, I think I know a cool riff we could put there. I went home, uh, got an acoustic, it was like a hundred bucks, wrote it, came back, recorded it, and we stuck it in the game. And this is actually a clip from the original Death Sound. So that was the sound when you would actually die in the game, it would laugh at you. And that was what we were about. And it wasn't until the next map, 
called Verrucked that it turned into an actual song, the Elena song, the original one. Uh, we needed a singer, and there was a, a girl who was the AP on... Oh, producer. Producer, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Not assistant producer, producer. On James Bond, Quantum of Solace, and my boss said she could sing, so I said, okay, we'll use her. And then we recorded, and we put it in the map as an Easter egg that you would access by flushing that toilet three times. <laughs> And that's, we never told anybody, but that was actually a uh, call out to Sierra game called Manhunter. Um, and it, I have it slash of four, because I honestly don't remember what we originally named it. Uh, when you finish a song, the legal department asks you, you know, what's the name of the song? We have to copyright it, and I don't remember. So we just copyrighted them both. Um, we probably should copyright of slash four, too, but we haven't done that yet. And here's a little clip from it. I think we're supposed to have this running to the speakers, but uh, we're just getting laptops on here. It's okay, she's actually gonna sing it at the end anyway, not to spoil anything. All right, now, now that we have a little history, I'm gonna talk about some little heady music theory stuff here. Uh, when I go to write for zombies, I reference something called the Doctrine of Ethos, which is basically just a collection of writings from ancient Greece about how sound affects human behavior and therefore its moral influence on society. Um, I have a, a quote here from Aristotle and he says, we accept the division of melodies proposed by certain philosophers into ethical melodies, melodies of action, and passionate or inspiring melodies, each having, as they say, a mode corresponding to it. And he thought that the various modes represented human passions or emotions and if you played them, you could elicit those emotions. And Plato says music can not only uh, affect the emotions temporarily, but can also permanently affect one's character. So, in essence, you play an angry song, you get an angry person. Uh, any metal fans out there may have seen a mosh pit before, and I assume this is, I don't know what concert this is, but it's probably an angry song. So, I am trying to, something like that. And this next one just kind of looks like that, so I threw it in there, it's a bunch of hungry cats. You know? <laughs> Uh, we, we all do the same stuff, I guess. <laughs> so now let's move on to something called scale gender. And basically what that is, is scales are separated by major or minor. And it's a really Cliff Notes version of how it works. But the third scale degree of a scale will tell you whether it's major or minor. So Corey, play the first three notes of like a major scale. And now minor. That one note change in any scale will determine its gender, and then the rest of the notes are really just for color. So we think of happy, like this is like just distilled happiness right here, right? A dog with as many tennis balls as he can handle. So <laughs> Corey, play a, a short progression in just major. That's what that sounds like. <laughs> Everyone is happy. But let's wait here for 10 seconds while we cleanse our palate with silence. You can study the, the box and see if you can figure it out. 10 awkward seconds. Now let's go to minor, or our sad mode. Sad face. There we have sad, or the sound of that, that kitten right there. <laughs> now, <laughs> let's skip off a little bit here and talk about what we are. I mean, uh, I don't know if anyone knows, am I too old here, the Soylent Green reference here, but um, we're all made of the same stuff. You know, particles, atoms, elements, cells, tissue, organs, emotions. We're capable of doing good and evil. And what the zombie apocalypse model does is challenge our notions of or decency in the face of survival, basically, is all it is. And, you know, as refined as we get, you know, if the apocalypse were happening right now, and, you know, we had tents in here, and we, we broke into that vending machine back there, and we're eating the last of the Snickers bars, you know, we have buckets over here by Corey for whatever. Uh, <laughs> you know, if we ran out of food, at some point, we would be eating each other. And I guess you could say that society is measured by its distance from cannibalistic necessity. Might be a bit extreme, but you know. <laughs> and 
since I'm talking about eating each other, I might as well use a recipe metaphor. Um, you know, we're, you know, like we're made out of the same stuff, same ingredients, but different proportions, you know. Um, so if, if we're the same thing, we could assume that we all have something in common with Gandhi, but then we must also assume we could have something in common with uh, Vlad the Impaler. Now, granted, good old Vlad probably, he's not an alien with some, you know, crazy DNA, he's just a regular human being like us, different circumstances, different time, uh, different proportions, you know, and he probably had a little bit more... I guess, aggression and cruelty compared to Gandhi, right? Because Gandhi was about passive, uh, what is it, passive resistance. And, and Vlad was about impaling 75,000 people on his front yard, which, I don't know, seems e excessive, I guess. <laughs> now, we have our happy and sad. Those are our basics. And complexity is really just made up of simplicities. And that's the same thing with our emotions. You know, we're never really just happy or just sad. There's other combinations, and if we are to imitate or elicit real emotion in music, especially for zombies, then we can't just rely on happy or sad or, the, you know, the basics. So sometimes that means triggering a series of the basic emotions in a specific order. And this is uh, Monet's, one of the water lily ones, I think. And, you know, if you look really close, up close, this uh, picture kind of looks like, uh, what did you say? Like like vomit, yeah. But as you back up, it's beautiful. So we have entropy up close and then beauty and order when you back up. So the closer you get to something or the farther you get to something, then, you know, they tend to look the same. And music is the same way. You know, emotions of chords and melody change and evolve in relation to the distance of one another. That's why we took that 10 second break earlier. So, you know, we have um, green and red, although the projector is changing a little bit there. But when you mix them, you have yellow. It's his own independent thing. So from that 10 second pause, we were able to kind of cleanse our ears and play it and distill them and just kind of hear it, you know, sad kitty dog with tennis balls. But now we're going to take those two basics and combine them closely and see if we can't get something a little more complex. So I'm going to have Corey start with a vamp going from our basic major chord and then going to our minor and back and forth. So our home is going to be major and we're going to move away to minor and then come back to it and see what happens. Now we're going from happy to sad immediately with no space in between. Just the two basic chords. And it sounds like maybe uncertainty. That's what I use it for. You're safe for now. You've escaped the killer, but he's still out there. Maybe longing. You have an image that makes you happy, but you're sad that you don't possess it. Desire. And there was a game from a long time ago on the PS1 that I think captured this perfectly. And that was the original Resident Evil game. The safe room was the only place in the game you couldn't be attacked. And that's where I learned this combination of feelings that you could evoke. You know, you can store your stuff, you know, you're making your herbs, you're storing your potions, and you know you couldn't be attacked in there, but it just gave this feeling like you have to go back out there. It used to give me nightmares. It was so perfect. All right, now we're going to change it up, and we're going to do the opposite of that. We're going to go from, what we did? We just did happy to sad. We're going to go sad to happy. We're going to go minor to major now. Um, so I'm going to have Corey do the same thing, but backwards. We're going to start with sad and then move away to happy and come back. Something a little more grand. Now we have something a little more similar to hope. Something is bad, but with a background of good. Maybe a desire to make better. Or it's a light at the end of the tunnel. Which in zombies, we always have to have that feeling because you're constantly overwhelmed. Even though in our game mode, you always die. But you're trying not to. But there you have it. That's the, how we take happy and sad and make something a little more complex or a little more human, I guess. Very nice. All right, now let's go on to the actual modes. And again, Cliff Notes version of the modes. 
Um, essentially, we have you know, two octave C scale here, and depending on what note you start and end on, you'll have a different mode. So if you start in C and end on C, you have one mode, and if you start on D and end on D, you have another mode. So they all share the same notes, but you can evoke different colors and flavors out of them that way. Um, and I'm only gonna talk about four of them. Uh, and they're based on ancient Greek modes, but I'm just gonna use the modern church modes for, you know, because that's what I use. Ancient Greek ones don't sound good with zombie music. Um, and I'm gonna talk about two major ones and two minor ones. The, the two major are Ionian, or the major scale, and Lydian, which is used in every movie you've ever seen, and then Aeolian, or the minor scale, and Dorian. So let's start with the major scale, or our, you know, our, our happy mode, dog with tennis balls. It's the mother of all scales, it's the first thing you learn as a student, but there's something very important about it. That five, seven, that Roman numeral five to one, that movement is the basis of everything in Western music. Everything you've ever heard is either doing that or not doing that, so that you know they're not doing that. So this, this will be on the test. Uh, so what it is is basically a resolution relationship. So I'm going to have Corey do a bunch of five ones here, and we're going to feel how it sounds to want to go back to a chord. Resolution. And again. So that's how you resolve it. That's all it is. Now, we're going to have him do the same thing, but not resolve. Oh. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Uh, that was 10 seconds. That's my record, right? Yeah. Now, there's a story about a composer who lived next to a terrible music student. I can't remember who it was. It was Bach or Mozart. And the student was supposedly terrible and never resolving. And it drove the composer crazy. And he kicks down the door and resolves it over and over just to get rid of that brain worm. I have to find out who that is. I don't, I don't remember who that was. Anyway, Plato. <laughs> I didn't actually make that picture. I found that. So I figured I had to use it. Uh, Plato rejects Ionian and Lydian as effeminate in favor of Dorian and Phrygian, which he felt portrayed courage and sobriety. So, you know, if you ever get pulled over for DUI, I guess you could sing a little Dorian real quick and see how that works out for you, but maybe the courage will help. <clears throat> um, I'm going to give my not so humble opinion about major scale. I think it's extremely boring and vanilla. That's a vanilla flower right there and some vanilla beans. And I'm going to have Corey vamp in our vanilla scale while I talk about it for a second so that we can get used to it and so that we can change it and turn it into something different. Isn't it funny how we use vanilla to describe things that are ordinary? You know, vanilla is one of the most labor-intensive food products out there. Vanilla beans are the fruit of an orchid, and it flowers once a year for a very short amount of time. It has to be hand-pollinated. After it's picked, it has to be cooked, sweated, dried, and cured. The whole process takes up to a year and a half, and it only grows in certain parts of the world, and this is the term that we use for ordinary. I guess it just goes to show that ordinary is only something that you use over and over. Now that we're used to our vanilla scale here, we're gonna evolve it and change it a little bit to make it more dark, I guess. We're going to have Corey take something from the minor scale, and it's called the flat six, flat seven, one, and we're going to have him cadence with that, and we'll notice a little difference. Now we're somewhere else. Eh, not bad, huh? Now we're going to have him do the same cadence, but we're going to land on the minor major seven and put us into a world of zombies. Now, we're somewhere else. Now we went back in time and changed all that major stuff to maybe a scene where you're having memories of good times before the apocalypse. So it was just sitting there in vanilla, something we did later changed what it meant earlier. So it's something unique that you can do in music.
Okay, Lydian. Lydian is what I call the movie scale, and there's only one note difference between major and Lydian. Show them. And do a little chord progression, major. Oh, that's Lydian, yeah. It's a little magical sounding. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. So Lydian, Lydian's in every movie you've ever seen. And that's actually Clark S. Nova from a bunch of my songs. This car was outside the restaurant we always go to in Santa Monica, so we, we had to take the opportunity to do the movie cover. It has a feeling of destiny or soaring, a magical effect. And destiny is very important in zombies because you always end up meeting him. And I call it the movie mode, like I said, because it's in everything. Uh, Back to the Future, Never Ending Story, Indiana Jones, E.T., The Simpsons, and on and on and on and on and on. But it doesn't really work too well in zombies, just as is. So we have to combine it with something else. And when we mix something magical with something depressing, like a mic pop, we get something a little more sinister, demonic, a mixed feeling of awe and terror and impressive destruction. Matter of fact, uh, one of my songs called Paradolia, there, you're not supposed to be able to read this, I'll read it for you. There's a, a YouTube comment from somebody describing the actual chord progression that Corey played on there, this one right here. And I wanted to read it to you. This is what it meant to this guy. He said, I love the breaking of tension with a sense of false and disappointing security of playfulness as yet to allude to something. Such is the theme and deeper meaning of Zombie's storyline. As a little girl who never asked for this has become a goddess of death, displaying that she is just a little girl with a sense of pureness in her heart. And he got that from those four chords, so I don't know if it says that to you specifically, but maybe Plato is right. And worth mentioning, the Lydian scale, its only difference from the major is the sharp 11, but that has a profound effect on everything, and studying that change and what it can do to music is what led me to a lot of composition techniques. It's a very strange scale. If you, anytime you go out of your normal scale and it's a major chord, you can play Lydian over it and treat it as if it were borrowed and it just does really cool things. All right, on to the alien or minor scale. So go ahead, let's, let's get some minor going. Minor. Plato omits it from the Republic and supposedly because he figures it's the same thing as Dorian, but I don't really believe that because it's very, very different and it's the basis for every single thing that I write. It has a very haunting despair quality to it. <laughs> That's one of my favorite movies of all time. But there's another genre that uses Aeolian in its pure form almost ex exclusively, and that's dance music. So I want to see if we could get Corey to, on the spot, maybe come up with a dance tune. Like a oomsu, oomsu, oomsu. Right, right. And dance music uses this? I don't know, maybe they have that lamenting kind of, I wish this night would last forever, or I'm sad that I, all my ecstasy ran out or something, I don't know. <laughs> but dance music always uses it. Now, the most borrowed tool from minor is the flat six, flat seven, one, which we added to major earlier to change it a little bit. Uh, it's been in everything, every pop song and just everything. I use it all the time. I try to find creative ways to kind of repurpose it and hide it. Um, and I do this in a song called Abracadabra, which was in a concert last night, uh, during the bridge, and it's the only time Elena says the name of the song, and I use that to kind of build that up there, because it has this really epic effect to things. And there's another song called We All Fall Down, which I do to actually accentuate the outro. Let me see if this is actually going to play. If not, we'll... I will just skip it. We'll play it later. Uh, okay, on to Dorian. Uh, I'm calling Dorian Miner's Lydian, just so everyone's clear. <laughs> it has a relationship to minor the same way Lydian does to major. And Dorian to me means fair maidens jousting in mead. Because, well, we'll get into the genres in a second. And the only difference between Dorian and minor is a raised six. So it's very medieval sounding, like this. And as with Lydian, this half step creates a profound difference. And Socrates says, 
After stating that all modes but two must be discarded or thrown away, two modes which you must leave, two which will best express the accents of courage in the face of stern necessity and misfortune, and of temperance and prosperity won by peaceful pursuits. One of them is Dorian. That's very specific, but that's how he felt. And there's, an, uh, there's a feeling that you get with Dorian that Corey and I call the Dorian lift. And that goes when traveling from the tonic chord to the four chord. So I'm gonna have Corey do a little demonstration and make some facial expressions when he hits the lift. There it is. That's how you feel when you... So you get this, it's like a, you're taking off or soaring, or, or, or it's like Kermit riding Falcor in front of a rainbow. <laughs> now, the genres of Dorian that's usually associated with uh, are, are fantasy genres, like Lord of the Rings. Uh, it gives a medieval feeling. Uh, I think composers use Dorian the same way casting directors use the British accent to kind of give you that long ago and far away feeling. So if you like fantasy genre, then you like Dorian. One of my favorite game series ever, Castlevania, is Dorian everywhere. Every game, all the time, like this. That's such a beautiful piece. So, you like Castlevania? You like Dorian? And I would also say that, you know, if you like Maluka, then you... <laughs> or Skyrim, then you like Dorian. Thank you for shaving for the show. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, now we need to talk about music for the, the apocalypse. Uh, I'm actually gonna have the choir do this for me, and Maluka. Uh, we, we, we gotta use our tools now to build something that's gonna give us the feeling of, you know, the end, essentially. So we're gonna invoke a feeling of deep despair and we're gonna do that with the choir in Maluka with a song called, Where Are We Going?
So everybody depressed now? <laughs> so that song is actually written for uh, our Mob of the Dead, which is about purgatory, essentially. It's guys who keep going in a, a circle and they can't get out. So that's the where are we going, the premise for it. So I tried to evoke that with a few of the modes that we were talking about. And uh, it, it would have been possible without her singing it. That was fantastic. You are amazing. Thank you. OK, now that we are depressed, we need to do something destructive <coughs> for music purposes. Uh, the zombie apocalypse almost assures us an early and horrible death. It, it crushes our innate human perception of being the center of the universe. And where we once had control, we are now hunted and in defense of our own existence. So it's an existential point, I guess, I'm trying to make here. And now we should really try to comprehend our own insignificance if we are to write something apocalyptic. And I think a good way to do this is uh, the Hubble telescope had its 25th year anniversary last week. And a good model to show how small we really are is with the planets in solar scale, in cosmic scale. So this is our Earth. This is everything we've ever known, every person we've ever met, every place we've ever traveled, everything we've ever done, all the music we've ever listened to. And if you've traveled really far, you know how long it takes, and you can imagine how big it really is. It's huge. It's 40,000 kilometers around, which is enormous. But it's really small compared to the star that keeps us alive. This is 150 million kilometers away. So far, it takes light eight minutes to reach us. It's nearly a million miles around, and we could fit a million of everything we've ever known inside it without even thinking about it. But on a cosmic scale, it's really not that big. This is Ada Carinae, five million times larger than that million times larger than everything we've ever known. But again, Betelgeuse, 300 times larger than Ada Carinae. So big it would take light an hour to travel from its core to its outer edge. But it's still dwarfed by VY Canis Majoris. 1,975,220,000 kilometers around, a billion times bigger than the star that is a million times bigger than our Earth. But this monster is still just a point of light in our Milky Way galaxy which is home to over 2 billion stars and 100 billion planets. It takes 250 million years for the Earth to revolve around the center black hole. And it's about 100,000 light years across. But our nearest neighbor, Andromeda, is double that. And it's gonna collide with us in about 4 billion years. So you should probably stock up on canned goods and ammunition. <laughs> Maybe water, bottled water. But next to M87, which is on 980,000 light years across, it's small. And these beasts are pretty big and scary, but here we go to what's really insane. That's IC 1011, which is 6 million light years across and a billion light years from Earth, and it contains over 100 trillion stars, bigger than the ones that we saw before. So it's pretty impressive. But in 1995, the Hubble telescope pointed towards a section of the sky that was 1 24 millionth of the sky, and it was completely black. We didn't think anything was there. So after 10 days of exposure, they looked, and this is what they saw. Nothing but galaxies. Well, we thought there was nothing in the space between spaces. There was everything. It just seems to be unending. So this overwhelming effect is something that we can use to show something in the zombie mode as well. Because it doesn't really matter about one monster, it's about overwhelming odds. All right, well, now that we've come so far to reach the end, it'd be only fitting to hear music that mocks us with the same irony. 
And I'm going to end it with a song that started the whole zombie mode music thing. And it's the song that serenades you when you fail to survive. <laughs> and uh, the one that I did with Elena back in the beginning. And it's called Lullaby uh, of, for, slash, <laughs> maybe a, a dead man, possibly, yeah. So the choir and her are going to come up here, but I, I want to say thanks to everybody for having me and, uh, you know, Maluka and Elena for being amazing. I couldn't have done any of that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the choir, uh, Joy and Trent uh, and Corey for playing piano for me here today. Uh, Bill Anderson and John Raffis for setting us all up and taking logistics in the, so I didn't have to think about anything or rehearse or do anything. It was amazing. Uh, the Treyarch Sound Department, uh, Mike and IT, and you know my family and my wife for putting up with me. And every time I said I don't think I can write songs anymore, I should have gone to business school. They point me in the right direction. And yeah, and the fans and all you guys, I really appreciate it. So enjoy.
that is by far the most creative keynote lecture that we have ever heard at our annual conference. And so it was uh, a mix of philosophical substance, musical theory, and it was educational because now we know why Kevin's music haunts us so much. We want to open up the floor uh, for some questions. If you have a question, just put your hand up and I'll be happy to bring the mic over to you. And Kevin, maybe go up. Questions? Yeah, I was debating uh, whether to cut some of it out because I know it, it, uh, theory is something you can just go down a rabbit hole with. I mean, you, we could talk about, I mean, the ethos covers tempo, the instrument, the range. You know, if you use low notes, they sound darker than high notes. You know, if you use a flute as opposed to an electric guitar, you know, and tempo, yeah, faster and slower can elicit different things. I just, uh, it was just in an interest of time. But yeah, that's a very good point. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, that's one of the, of the tough things about songwriting or just composition in general is when to make it intellectual and when to let go and really fighting yourself against that is what you have to do. Um, but I start out with some sort of structure. If I get to a place where I'm like, I need to move here, I need to modulate, then you know a little classical theory might come into play. But I have to be able to take a step back and go, does this sound good? And sometimes I do something where, you know, Corey and I will look at it and go, this doesn't make any sense, but we're leaving it and we don't care why. <laughs> um, in your pieces uh, that you composed, uh, you talked a lot about melody and the feelings that are both in that, but um, I know that you've done a lot of stuff with death metal and that genre of sure it's Call of Duty. Um, what would you say is the impact of percussive elements that get symbols? Yeah, I guess it, it helps to add a lot of energy, depending on how they're used. You know, if you have big, you know, like a gong or a cymbal or some, you know, uh, Middle Earth drums, you can give epicness to it. But with something like a song like 115 or uh, Archangel, it's more about the driving energy, kind of the pummeling of your brain when you listen to it. But you still have to try to maintain some sort of song structure underneath there, so it's always tricky. So then is it almost complementary to the melody? I would think so. It's, uh, I think Zombies is about juxtaposition, especially when I'm using, you know, like, you know, Elena and Maluka's sweet voices with really dark lyrics is the same thing as talking about something happy over a death metal rhythm. <laughs> so I'm trying to use them all in a similar fashion. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Lots of questions. This is good. That's good, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty true, <laughs> Your lyrics are pretty dark. <laughs> <laughs> and Grandma, is that you? I the composition myself as basic and as simple as it can be. Salt tones and mostly uh, chant. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to ask, have, have the lyrics Kind of, have they changed you in a way? Like when you think about how, where am I going to write the lyrics here? How, have they really changed you? Or how, how about this? Let's answer this one. <laughs> um, do you have to get to a certain frame of mind to be able to write the lyrics that you're about to write? As you sit down. Do you yeah. Yeah, it's really hard to write songs like this when my bills are paid on time and it's like 12 in the afternoon and I'm on the beach. So it's usually when I'm in crunch time on a game, you know, and there's overwhelming stuff going on and uh, I actually have to disrupt my sleep schedule. And there's something about writing in the middle of the night when it feels like there's no one else in the world that it really helps. It just comes to me. 
But you know that that week is pretty brutal because I'm not sleeping correctly anymore. But yes, I, I have to do that. So I guess it's a little bit of a sacrifice, but you do what you got to do. Before we let all the musicians talk, a question. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh man. Maybe perhaps more philosophical, <laughs> lyrical, content-wise. We'll come back. <laughs> Notice they're asking all the theory questions. Yeah, I'm mean, kind of worried about that. <laughs> I don't have a question, I have a comment to make. Sure. It's like impossible to ask for more. Oh, How thank you. I'm hearing you incorporate something such as like the existence in the unknown of space, which is so dramatic in the life. It's of crazy, life. right? And then hearing it. How like different types of notes affect the mind. Like, that's like so powerful. That's the way I felt too when I first uh, when Corey and I first started looking at it. That's what drove me to want to write. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Like it's so much to live for. Right on. Thanks, man. There's a couple more. Ah, the philosopher. Uh oh. <laughs> We're doomed. <laughs> We're all doomed. <laughs> well, you have to come and see how theology deals with zombies tomorrow. <laughs> so, I'm, what I want to know is to what extent and how do you think music teaches us or reveals truth? Either just the very fact that it exists, or and, and all this structure and what it does and seems to convey. So what what do you think that is there anything you infer from that? And also just the music itself as it affects us, do you think it reveals truth to us? I would say a simple answer would be know the if you want to know the man, know the compositions. There's a lot that, you know, music reveals about the person who's writing it. You know, not to say you know, my lyrics are how I'm feeling all the time, you know, but you can derive similar emotions. You know, there's always like a range that you can go down where you can be angry but not be a serial killer, or be happy and not be a crazy person, you know. But I, I think music is, is who you are, essentially. You know, maybe years from now, physiology will involve music in some way because it probably affects a person the same way that maybe vitamins do. And once we understand that completely, then it'll just be one and the same study. Maybe, maybe not. That kind of answer? What was the B part again? Oh, yes. Yes. I think music's one of those things you can't help but be affected by when you hear it. You know, if you're in a movie, it's, that's why the film score is so great. Because if you ever watch like a powerful scene with nothing in it, with no music, it's almost like nothing is happening. But then you put something in there that, you know, it just gives you goosebumps and chills and it just... It does, it just fires up neurons that you don't even realize that you have at the time, and it just makes you want to find out more. I don't, I don't know how to explain it, really, other than that. But it, it definitely has an effect. I think a lot of it is unexplainable right now. The good thing about holding the mic is you get to ask the questions. <laughs> Marion's going to be the last question. Okay. So what is your music saying about you personally, and what is your hope? Well, I, I'd like to think of myself as a question asker. I don't really think I have a lot of answers. And, you know, where are we going probably, you know, sums it all up. I, I like everybody else, probably have a reasonable fear of death. Uh, I hate flying, so I can usually write songs around the uh, time I have a flight pretty well. <laughs> um, I mean, Corey knows what that's about, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, but I don't know, I, I like to just ask and I try to not declare things. And I think that's what everything is about. Okay, I have to ask, when I first got this music to learn it, I was like, oh, I'll just listen to this stuff on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, did you ever expect this music to be put into a choir setting? No, <laughs> no. My second question is, do you like it in the choir setting? 
I thought it was amazing. I was stunned at how awesome it was. You guys did a fantastic job, and I can't believe that Trent was able to arrange it. Yeah, well deserved. <laughs> you, just, you didn't move, and you just uh, sat there, and you like, hey, let's take. <laughs> no, I didn't realize you guys were watching me. Sorry about that. I, I just didn't feel like I was real at that point, so I was just sitting there kind of stoic, like, is this real? This is crazy. It was very surreal, I guess. Yeah. That was a little shout-out to a lyric. I don't know if anyone got that. It was fantastic, though, seriously. And I... Dude on the piano, I'm sorry, man. Your left hand must be hurting. That, that was never meant to be played on piano. Yeah.